everyone uh, to uh, this first session of the Future of Events. I'm uh, Martin Goldschmidt um, from Cooking Vinyl. Uh, I'm uh, really... whoops. If anyone wants to uh, silence their phones at this time, it can be a good idea. Um, so I, I'm quite honoured to be on this panel of, uh, of uh, people with experts. Well, experts who I've got masses of respect for everyone on here. Um, I'll let you introduce them in a, in a minute, Tim. But the, the idea is that everyone comes at this topic, the future of the record deal, from a different perspective. And, uh, you know, everyone's got their own agenda. And the idea is for people to lay it out how they see it now, where they see it going. And that's the idea of this series of uh, talks that we're doing on the future of various key topics in the music business. Um, we're trying to get those debates going and get some ideas about where how the industry can evolve. It's a it's it feels like a very strange time in the music business at the moment. Um, it's it's funny, a year ago the future of streaming seemed obvious and now you know it seemed like it it was just happening and happening but now it seems really confusing what's happening with how how to monetize streaming with uh, the money that we get from uh, the freemium amount of streaming makes it very hard. It's, it's very strange times, very interesting times. And, and what, what's interesting about it is, yeah, there's definitely problems. But wherever there's a problem, there's an opportunity. I remember years ago, you know, people complaining massively in, in the industry about piracy. And then you look at someone like um, Steve Jobs or Daniel Eck from Spotify looking at the same problem, and they saw them as an opportunity. So I always think that... Yes, there's great problems, but it's also very exciting. Um, and another reason I wanted to do these is it's going to be our 30th anniversary next year. So it's quite good looking forwards because we've had a fantastic innings at Cooking Vinyl. Uh, and we're very excited about the next few years. So I thought it'd be good to bring people together and, and start presenting these, uh, these forums. Cheers, Martin. Cheers. Over to uh, Tim from Music Business Worldwide, who's going to do the hard work of uh, whipping us into line. Easy enough. Hello, hello. Am I coming out? That's good. Um, yeah, as Martin pointed out, one thing that I'm really looking forward to about this panel is we pretty much have people from every angle of the record contract, at least, um, be it manager, major label, independent label, lawyer or, or artist. And it's um, the artist that I'll begin the introduction with. Um, Billy Bragg is kind of needs no introduction, really. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that's the end of that. But, 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 but one aspect of Billy's career that you might not know is the history with Cooking Vinyl, um, which started on a services-based deal. Is that correct? Still the same deal. And still on the same deal now, same 23, deal. 23, 23, 23 yeah. years later. So Billy comes at it with, with a unique perspective there. Our lawyer is Paul Spraggan from SSB, who I'm sure is very well known in the room. Martin... You already know, hopefully. Um, but roster of Cooking Vinyl, of course, uh, includes the Prodigy, um, Billy himself, Cranberries, Lissy, and others. We also have Mike Smith there, who's, I don't want to say representing major labels, because they always do that oh, to you, Mike. Um, <laughs> but, but before Mike got there, he, he, he's president of music at Virgin EMI. He's signed on the publishing and record side uh, during his career, acts such as Blur, Supergrass, Arctic Monkeys, The Libertines, Beta Band, it's not a bad track record. Um, Virgin EMI, one thing that's particularly interesting there is just the sheer breadth of um, roster. It represents everyone from the Libertines, uh, imagine how that deal happened, uh, to Emily Sunday, Taylor Swift, Iggy Azalea, um, The Vamps, Ella Air, and Blossoms, all the way down to a sort of baby band that are coming through now. And then from machine management, we have um, Phil Morais. And Phil, you'll have to let me know if I get this wrong, but I know for a fact that Machine do Clean Bandit, which is a big yeah, hot uh, act. Clean Bandit, Aluna George, uh, Years and Years, Mika, uh, the magician, Mark Ruff, uh, producer, writer, who's having great success at the minute, having written and produced a lot of those records that you just mentioned, or I was just mentioned. Um, so yeah. So that's and I think year, Years and Years is one of the few acts that Debut albums to reach gold this year. Correct. Really, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they've done extremely well and uh, lucky to be in that position. It's great for us and everyone, and the music industry in general. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to uh, circle around streaming. Martin's <laughs> already said that S word. Um, 
over and over, I'm sure. Um, I want to start with Billy because um, we've talked previously just on the phone once about how you uh, got some of your catalogue back or you, you attracted some yeah. of your rights and that had a real mm. impact mm. on the income that you saw from yeah. services such as Spotify. So I was just wondering if you could... Yeah, ba basic, basically, um, I, I've um, <clears throat> always owned my own back catalogue. Um, and that came about... Um, not, it wasn't a very, very easy. My old record label, Go This, very often uh, uh, when we were uh, signing a new album, as we're doing album by album deals, my manager and the managing director used to get into screaming arguments that went on, protracted screaming arguments that would end up me being resolved by me going in to see the, uh, the MD of the record label and looking him in the eye and saying, look, I've paid for this record, I've written it, who's pension should it be? Should it be mine or should it be yours? And to give him his due, he always eventually acquiesced and said, all right, fair enough, it should be yours and it's probably just as well because he doesn't own Go This anymore. It's owned by Universal, some faceless person who neither of us know will be getting the, the revenue from my record. So it's very, very important to me. And um, over the years, I've worked with artists. I've worked for a while uh, with um, Ian McLagan, God rest his soul, he passed away last year. He was the keyboard player in The Small Faces. And when we toured around the UK together, every time we stopped in a motorway service station, he'd go into mm -hmm. WH Smith's, there would be a 60s compilation with a Small Faces track on it. He'd pull it out, he'd look on the back, and he'd know, and he'd say to us, I'm getting no money from that. Now, I looked at Mac. I mean, he's, Mac was an amazing guy. He played with so many great people. And he still had a career. He still had a career all those years later. 50 years after we started, he was still doing gigs. Still carrying his Hammond organ around on a trailer in Austin, Texas. And still getting no money from those records that he played on. And that, to me, is one of the problems that we have as artists. The urge to sign a life of copyright deal. Is, I can understand why people do it. Because it's that initial opportunity you get that very first deal and you sign that deal that's when you can go back and say to your mates I've got a record deal that's when your dreams come true I understand that but I do think we should be in this modern times particularly now um, with the advent of uh, digital music we should be looking at ways of of ensuring that after a certain amount of time I don't know how long you know or after uh, on albums after been totally recouped or something that uh, the rights revert to artists and artists have the right again to go back and make another deal if they wish or to exploit those records themselves either online or selling stuff at gigs. Now, there may be some of you in the room thinking to yourself, oh my God, you know, what, what will happen to me if I let my artist just waltz off? Well, Martin and I signed a two-year deal 23 years ago. And after that deal ended, I thought he'd done a pretty good job, so I gave him another. And after that, I thought he'd done a pretty good, and we're still working together because of the loyalty that we have for each other, which is based on, on mutual respect. And he, you know, does his best for me, and I, I respect that and his staff, and I feel very much part of what's going on at Cooking Vinyl. I haven't waltzed off to other labels, I haven't run away. In fact, uh, recently I'd signed for the world with him, which I hadn't done before. I'd previously had a different deal in the United States of America. So, you know, the future where artists have more control over their uh, material isn't so bleak. Because I can tell you this, for all Martin's best efforts, and even if I was signed with a bigger label, there's nobody who's better at promoting Billy Bragg records than me. <clears throat> and if you gave me that, you give me that right, you give me those tools online, you give me the right to sell my stuff online, uh, you know, I'm going to go out there and do that. And for, uh, I'm, re I'm fortunate, I'm nearly 60 now, and I'm still able to, you know, on my last tour I played, I sold out night at the Hammersmith Odeon. But there's plenty of other artists out there who were just playing in rooms as big as this who made you know, great records in the 1970s or the 1980s. They could be selling them at the back of the hall with all the other bits of the tracks that didn't get used. They could clump them on there, be selling them at the back of the hall and making a bit of a living. And the ridiculous aspect of the life of copyright deal is they can't do that. And sometimes they can't do it because the record company that they signed up with doesn't even exist anymore. You know, so it's a, ma it's a matter of, of, of responding, of contractually responding to the freedom that the internet has given us, not only to sell shit, but to connect with people who were there at those gigs in the <clears> 1970s that you can do now on Facebook, and being able to, to make... All we want to do is make a living, all of us, whichever aspect we're, we're part of. 
and, and as artists, we're, we're having longer careers now, and I think we, the industry needs to, to change the way it thinks to allow us to benefit from that. Paul, is that um, life of copyright issue becoming something that's um, better known? Are artists making um, more demands on the, the terms by which they get their rights back or otherwise? Testing, testing. Does this work? <laughs> OK. Um, it's a quite a long question. I could just say yes. <laughs> Um, the truth is that when I started out in 1984-85 as a lawyer, you never expected to get your rights back when you were negotiating for an artist. And in the last 10 to 15 years, actually in the 90s when the Britpop explosion happened, lawyers got quite a lot of power, booze, no, booze yeah. and we were able to leverage that power, especially firms like Staten Gill Davis who had all the sort of hot indie bands. And they'd say to the label, you can sign X, Y or Z but we want the rights back in 10 or 20 years' time. And that actually happened. I've seen the contracts. They would get the <coughs> copyrights back. So that was when it... I don't want to blame John and Cass for doing that, but they sort of bro broke the dam open a bit. And I'm about to send out a deal proposal which has a 10-year license in it for a new act who are getting a lot of interest under the radar. We're not hyping it. We're not doing a Claire Maguire. We're trying to be very careful. But we're asking for a license for 10 years. Um, Phil, is that something that plays into your mind now? Yeah. Is it, you know... and. and what I wanted to ask you about specifically is, do you have more power as a manager to build an artist's um, reputation and influence to the point that you can start making those demands of a label? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, I think in, an, in another scenario, you could, you know, you could get to a position where you can, you know, be able to make those demands and, and, and as managers and, you know, we're, uh, like, like some lawyers and, and people, we're kind of a lot way, a lot of the time down the ladder in terms of discovering artists uh, ahead of the A and R sometimes, um, um, because the first thing an artist kind of wants is a, is a lawyer to make sure that they understand, um, you know, the ins and outs and intricacies of the business, but also a manager to help drive, help their career. And so, so we do get involved, yes, yeah, super early in terms of building and um, building that hype. And I think, of course, it's like uh, as as Paul points out, it, it uh, those kind of deals are very hard to come by I think now and you know some some indies that I won't mention who would probably would, would would sort of you know sort of stand by the fact that they're they're, they're incredibly an in, in indie label and, and publicize that their deals are like for copyright so you know it, it's a real tough it's a tough it's a tough one and, and to get to a point where you can be in a position to, to be able to sort of negotiate that is, is hard. It's very, very hard. And, uh, you know, fair play to you, Paul, to have an artist that, that are in that position. I'm guessing there's a lot of competition um, in order to... Or they, have they made a record or are they in a position well, where they... They've developed it through the producer. Yeah, got you. Right. So I suppose in that sense, it's it kind of a lot of the time it really comes down to, you know, what, what is a... You know, I'm not, not talking for a record company here, but I'm, I'm guessing, you know, what are we putting onto the, you know, what are we investing, you know, what, how much money are we putting on the table to, to take this artist to the point they need to get to? What, what value are they adding? And if they're adding a lot of value, <clears throat> then, you know, you can, can, can maybe see the point of why record companies are asking for that. I'm not saying it's right, uh, uh, you know, but if sometimes, you know, you've, you've got a couple of deals on the table and they're all life of copyright, what do you do? You, you know, the artist has to then decide is this the right thing for me to do? Um, but I haven't seen many non-life of copyright deals, I have to say. But, I mean, yeah, but I'm, I'm guessing back in the day, it was maybe you the same night, there was a, f a few of those floating around. Um, it's, it's tough. <laughs> Mike, in, in reality, I mean, you've signed deals, so uh, I'm just going to go ahead and imagine that the Libertines re-signing to Virgin EMI wasn't cheap, um, but maybe um, Paul Heaton and Jackie Abbott, for instance, was a more sensible deal. I'm just guessing here. Yeah. Um, how flexible in reality can a major label be to those two types of artists and um, when it comes to things like Life of Copyright, 360, you know, what, what are you willing to take off the table in order to get an artist? I think it's completely open. I honestly don't think there are strict rules in terms of what we can and can't do. So, you know, as we talk about how to start your career, I think the artist that Billy talks about, as, and, and in the old days, I think it very much was like that. You were so grateful to get a record deal from anybody. You, you would jump in and you would sign deals that could be brutal to you in later years. I think now it's the control 
to a degree has moved back to the artist and the more that the artist can do themselves before mm. we get our hands on them, the more they're likely to be in control of the situation. And if you're fortunate enough, you know, like with Phil, to be able to develop an artist to a point that there's a lot of people that want to be in business with them, then hopefully you're in control to a degree yeah. of, of what the deal can be. I mean, there's, you know... We're spending, you know, 18 months, two, two years developing... Is this on? Can you hear me? Is this all? Yeah, it's like, you're, you know, we're spending like 18 months, like two years developing artists, you know, because, you know, you, it, that's what it takes now. It takes mm. uh, time to, to, to find this out and understand their audience, um, to, just deliver music into the market and, and, and to, to create a buzz and for people to get excited and not, you know, not everything works that way. Sometimes things, there are occasionally there are artists that, that sort of break relatively quickly but I mean years and years is a very good example I mean they've been a band for five years you know and that's taken so many different sort of guises and, and tran you know it's, tr it's transitioned to, into, the, into the beast it is now that, that took a long time um, to and, get and, to that point. And does it help you that, that the idea of a services deal which Cook and Bond and Billy were clearly pioneering with the idea that exists can you use that to put pressure on Polydor whoever yeah. else or, say, or do you actually say to your band you know wait a minute you know a life, life of copyright deal means this there is another way of doing this. Do you ever say to your bands, yeah, like, copyright I mean, deals, uh, kind yeah, of? Yeah, completely. I, I think it's, it's a, uh, yeah, I mean, look, in an ideal situation, you would have, as, as Mike pointed out, you've been, been in a position where you've developed the artist to, 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 to such a, a place where you've got, you know, you, you have competition for the deal and you can, you know, negotiate the best terms possible and, and one of those terms hopefully will be thing that we're talking about and, and you know having a breadth of interest in your artists from, from different areas of, uh, of people in the industry different labels that offer different things and fortunately there isn't that many options I suppose mm. and there isn't many labels that can do that and certain you know then it comes down to sort of who who's working at the label what are they going to what creativity going to creativity they're going to bring you know um, you know some, you have to weigh those things up against What's what's on the what's on, you know what's on the table in terms of a, in terms of a deal? So or what you know how much cash you need? Mm -hmm. Maybe you're managing a band and you're thinking actually this band aren't very good. It's all going to fall apart in six <laughs> months' time. <laughs> and that label over there is offering me a hundred thousand pounds more than that label. I'm not saying this. No, I sure, know you, sure. you would. I this think is, there's, there's but I think there are unscrupulous individuals out there that are probably seeing it as sort of Look, like grab what I can grab uh, now yeah. because most of most acts don't work. Sure. The funny thing is, though, Mike, that's how I got my. That's how I ended up with my uh, uh, deals because my first record, they just gave me a one-off contract. Nobody thought it was going to go anywhere. Mm. In fact, it was done as a sort of side project on the quiet. The fact it went to number one in the indie charts mm. then allowed me to go back with that behind me and make sure the next deal was on mm. my terms. So it's not always about the power that you have in there. It's actually how how you're able to um, use what you've got and build up because if you can. Uh, I know it's always harder working outside of the mainstream, but if you can uh, do it independently yourself so that you have already have that power, when you go to the, to, to the industry, right across the board, you're able to then get a deal on your terms. Now, your terms might be loads and loads of money, and, I, and I, I'm not against that. If fans want to do that, I'm not against that. But it is, it is worth checking, because one of the other great things about it is, over the years, Martin and I have been able to change my deals to adapt to new technology. Mm. You know, how many people have... The deals they signed in the 1960s that uh, you know don't even have CDs on it. Yeah, so I mean, that's a yeah. that's a benefit for all the, the entire mm -hmm. industry that you can sit down and say, look, you know, there's a completely new way of doing these things, and we need to talk differently about doing this. We can't pay in the way. In fact, the problem the industry has now is is artists uh, from the 21st, 20th century thinking they've got to be paid the same way in the 21st century for complete change of technology. So well, and, and so, executives as yeah, well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So the changes, you know. Having a new deal every every ten years is actually not such a bad business model. But, but I Isn't the problem that how many things fail and succeed? Does anyone know how many? If you sign a hundred artists to a major, how many succeed out of the hundred? Any any figures One, here? Five, there was a 4% figure that came well, up. Well, actually, it is 4%. Yeah. I've just spoken to the head of one of the senior people at Universal today, and they've confirmed it's 4% on their analysis. So they've got a 96% failure rate. Well, we all have, because the managers fail, the lawyers fail, the records fail. What is a failure? What is a failure? Uh, they describe anything less than a platinum record as a failure. So, unfortunately, years and years. <laughs> 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 
Well, you've got, you've got my entire career. career. <laughs> my <laughs> entire career is a failure on those stairs. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yes, yeah, so, But so, have you seen so the size of my ass? Yeah, but they're not. Everyone else has. There goes your thousand favourite records. Yeah, but very quickly, as a lawyer, the issue is that obviously looking at that, you think of two things. You think renegotiation. And I'm fortunate. And greedy bastards. Yeah, and, uh, and I'm fortunate, as people know here, to work for Adele, and she's done her last album for XL, well, it's coming out on the Friday the 20th. So I have no idea what that deal's going to look like, but she can effectively rewrite the record deal, I think, for, for the future, for anyone else. But of course, it's Adele. Mm. It's Billy Bragg. He's had a long career. By the time he came to Cooking Vinyl, you'd had many num number ones? <laughs> Indie number ones. Indie number ones. So your, your position is very privileged. I yeah, I, agree. I accept that. I totally accept so that. And also, the other thing is that I'm solo, so I yeah. didn't need a yeah. load of money up front. That well, helped as well. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's yeah. again, you know, the, all these factors that, that come in yeah. that, that becomes really important. But, but, I mean, going back to your point about building, and uh, it does lead into the record deal conversation, but you know, the UK is a very small place. And obviously with streaming and what's happening now and this little, you know, all this uh, Spotify, you know, iTunes music, you know, getting to a point where you, you can be in that position in the UK is very, very hard because mm. it's such a small, you know, it's a very small island. We've got Radio 1. It's very hard to sort of, to sort of really, um, to, to make an impact. Not many bands make an impact mm. in the UK yearly. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. very hard. To I think it's harder now. I mean, you have to remember hard. when yeah. I was first in it, there yeah. were four weekly music papers, yeah. one radio station. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it was, if you did make it, if you could get on Peel or if you could get on the front of the New Music, new music Express, yeah. you did have then a fair win behind you. So mm. I totally accept that has, that has completely changed. Mm. But, the, but, but the principle behind the artists owning their material, I think, has been enhanced by the internet and by digitisation mm. of music. Because now, we, the means of production, the reason why we, we accepted, you know, 8%, 15%, was because the record labels had to do all the heavy lifting. They had mm. to physically make the records, physically get them to the record shop, and most importantly of all, physically collect the money and bring it back to us. Now, but now that's changed. We, we ourselves can have that, can take that role on, as, as well as working with the record label. And if we had contracts that, let's say, for instance, um, that your standard contract uh, allowed the artist to act as a retailer for your own records and have a deal with the label that they're signed to on the same terms as, as iTunes. So that then, as an as artist retailer, I would be taking the retail cut for me and my cut, my 8% and maybe the markup, whatever it is now, 25%. That, you know, selling my own records with the label, you still make the same amount of money as the label. Mm -hmm. People still get their cut. But allowing an artist as retailer to work on the internet to get the word out there, I mean, that will be a way of giving much greater control to artists. Martin, have you seen, as a percentage, Billy mentioned the, the famous uh, 8 to 15% thing, the old, net yeah, royalty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have you seen that change as a percentage of the pie over the years? Where are we at now and where do you think it will go in the future? Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's changed a lot. You know, I mean, we do uh, artist service deals, which uh, we, we, we mentioned before, where... Basically, for anyone who doesn't know, and I'm sure everyone in the room does, but um, you know, you, you get a, a split of 75-25 or 80-20 in the artist's favour. That's not as good as it sounds because the artist pays for all the costs. So that means that the label then, um, if it recoups, gets that as a margin, which is much less than a traditional record yeah. company margin. But on the other hand, most deals don't recoup, so often it's much better than a yeah. traditional record company margin as well. It's, mm. You've got to do it. Uh, I mean, some artists complain that we're much too tight with money. Uh, you've got to do it quite forensically because when your margin's low, you have to recoup to, you know, like Billy said mm. earlier, we all want to earn a living. Yeah. You want, you know, Everybody, everyone here yeah. wants to earn a living. And if you're doing deals like that, if you've got a smaller margin, you need to be far more precise in terms of what money you spend to make sure that you recoup. And is there an element the, that you think the good, if the artist is profitable, you'll well, get more loyalty in the future? Well, first of all, the good thing is that the money you're spending is the artist's money, so it feels like more of a partnership yeah. from day one if you can communicate that. Um, and, you know, there's, yeah, one of the best ways of getting loyalty from an artist is sending them royalty checks of a decent size regularly. Close I mean, my boat. What's not to like, you know? And, uh, I mean, we've worked with a few artists. I, I was, uh, had uh, lunch with Suzanne Vega's manager in, in New York last week, and he couldn't believe how much money she'd earned. She'd, you know, she'd earned, well, hundreds of thousands of dollars when she, he expected to break even. 
Um, and, uh, you know, she'd done it, it we'd got, things had gone really well. Um, and, but, you know, she was in shock. At first she thought she wasn't going to see anything from the deal. And then the costs get paid off really quickly when you're on the lion's share of the income. And now she, you know, she's just very happy. And so is he with how, mm. how it's worked out. Now, it doesn't always work out like that. They should carry a health warning. Yeah. But, you know, it, it also comes back to the, the thing about success that you, you said. And I always think that success... Is, is like beauty, it's in the eyes of the beholder. And, you know, I, I mean, for me, it's not really about platinum records. Uh, on most of the records we release, we get very few platinum records. And if we were judged by that criteria, we would be a massive failure without any mm -hmm. shadow of a doubt. But we're still here, we're still enjoying it, we earn a living, we earn a living for a lot of our artists. And, and that, is, me, that, that is the definition of success, success. is to, to, to earn a living doing what you like doing. If you can do that, you are so far ahead of everybody else. And that's the fortunate thing that I've had with mine. And it's, it's not all, uh, you know, part, uh, you know uh, great stuff. I made my last album at the, at the beginning of um, 2012. It was finished, mastered, everything already to go. It then took me a year to build up a war chest to promote that record. But that's responsibility that I take. And I want to take that responsibility. I want to know how that money's been spent. I don't want to turn around at the end of the campaign and realise I've made absolutely no money. I'm in hock to someone. I want to know exactly how much money's going out and where it's going because I know it's my money, so I'm going to work my ass off for it rather than have it some abstract, huge record company that's got loads of money and just, you know, chucking it out. It makes me work a lot more focused. I'm not saying harder, but much more focused. So, Billy, you... Just, can I just touch in yeah, on sorry, the Mike. whole thing about getting your rights back? Because... I think it's a really important point, and you know, the, I've really only done one as a manager, one deal with a major in 1987 for Michelle Schott with Polygram, but she actually got a rights reversion after 10 years, and um, it, she ha had mixed feelings about signing with a major. She was a very political artist. It was she was very scary the whole concept, but she wanted to. Her main motivation was to get her music out to the world. And at some point in the negotiation, she, you know, she just said, look, I want my rights back. I'll give you the records for nothing. I'll pay for everything and I'll make them and I'll deliver them. Mm. And, you know, but I want my rights back. And they, you know, I remember the label were in shock. They'd never had an artist who said, I'll pay for everything. I just mm. want my rights back. They didn't know how to deal with it. I imagine it's happened a lot since then. But, but it, it's interesting. So there's two things, because I, I totally get what you said about the 4%, and a, a lot of acts you know, just don't recoup, and it's a financial nightmare. So it depends what your agenda is, whether your agenda is to get as much money as possible, to get your music out, whether you need money. I mean, maybe there's a role before getting a, le a record deal to get financing. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, Finance schemes that are starting to develop now, the MMF have got ones where you can get outside financing for the record, which means you can go to a label and say, you know, I just want you to take this to market. You don't need to take such a big risk. In return for that, I want my rights back. So it's, it's worth thinking about, and I think this is going to become a big part of the future of record deals, is outside finance. You know, yeah. I mean, basically there's... 50% tax breaks for someone to invest in various things, including, you know, record deals. So that means that the government are paying 50% to the investor, <coughs> which makes it quite much easier to finance records than it does for a record company. So it's quite a clever way for an artist to use a scheme like this, so that then they're not in the financial bind that they're normally in, mm -hmm. with the record company, and it <coughs> gives them more leverage in the negotiation. A little bit more power. Um, Mike, I don't want to. I, I do this to you on panels often. I'm not going to do it today. Make you answerable for the sins of major labels for decades <laughs> past. Um, but but when it comes to signing the traditional deal, which still happen, right? Yep. Big upfront advance, and that's our copyright, and off we go. Um, how do you justify that with the, with the types of acts that it happens with, both to yourself and uh, making the balance sheet make sense? I think you can justify it to yourself in that if it wasn't you doing this, nobody else would be doing it, and they. They are up for doing it. They've been well advised by a lawyer who hopefully knows what they're doing. Um, on a more realistic level, it's about the investment you're hopefully going to be putting into them. It's about the effort you'll make to break that act globally. If they've got absolutely nothing going on, 
whatsoever, and you just happen to have this wholehearted belief in the in the genius, um, then that does put you in a in a position of considerable power apropos them. If no one else is going out and recognizing the talent there. But to be honest, that happens very, very rarely these days. It's, I, I actually think major labels, by and large, want to see things going on and would rather pay a bit more money and maybe back off some of the rights that they're looking at, at in order to get something that is going to be a better bet. I mean, that, that's an interesting trend. I mean, Robbie Williams basically has a services deal with Ireland. Here, here might be wrong, but here that Ed Sheeran got his live rights back out of Warner. Yeah. I mean, are, are you... Becoming, Same happened with One Direction when they renegotiated with Sony. They got the live rights back. Are you, are, you, are, you becoming, are you becoming allowed to be more flexible, signing licensing <coughs> deals, services deals, and less intense traditional deals? I think as long as there is a good reason to be there and, and, and you're explaining... If we don't do this, we aren't going to get the talent they're going to sign to Sony or Warners. Then you will have the flexibility to do that. We're mm. not a cartel. Or we can go on. <laughs> but I, you know, I think people. You know, I'm delighted when I see people do it themselves. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm staggered more. Well, not staggered. I know why most people do, don't do it themselves because it's hard work mm. and they want to concentrate on the stuff that they actually got into the music business for, which is writing <laughs> songs, playing music, and doing that. They don't want to, you know. They don't want to put records out. That's the, and also, I would imagine from a manager's point of view, you don't want to be running a record label because if well, something I mean, goes horribly <clears throat> wrong, who yeah. do you blame? I mean, if you're a good manager, you take will have to take responsibility. You want to take responsibility for everything. You know, you, you know, it's important that you, you know, can take. You know, the buck stops with you. Otherwise, as 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 a manage, as a manager. Um, but but you're right. You want people involved who can add, um, who can add value. And I think it's hard to find. It's hard to find. It's hard to find. I think, it's, you know, finding A and R is is a, you know, it's, it's tough. And finding people is is a hard job. And finding people who can really add um, value in in that area is you know is is a big thing. And you know that that's one of the you know one of the major things you you really look for. I mean, it depends on the artist and what you're you know what area you're working in. And, and, but you you want. You want value fundamentally from mm. that record company. And if, if you are going to sign that, if you are going to sign a deal like that, you want to make sure you are getting something back in return. It is a wonderful feeling when a label moves as one, and you really do get the sense of that was a great A and R person plugging mm. into a great radio promo person, TV promo person, press team, marketing team mm. pulling it all together. When it all rolls as one and it works, it's 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 a marvelous, wonderful experience to to behold. It it probably doesn't happen anything like as often as it should. But that's the justification when it actually works for, for why you sign a deal like that. Can and people do it without record companies, do you think? Yeah, well, of course they can. I, this yeah. is the, the, I, I think name me a good example. Macklemore. Who? Macklemore, yeah. That's, that's one, one well, track example. Oh, well, so what do you say track. one track? You don't think this current album is going to be massive? No. Ooh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think, depending on the field of music, Alison, you. Alison Krauss, Fun Ivory. Uh, yeah. Carolina. Alison yeah. Krauss has been around for a long time. And yeah. was with Rounders, Rounder for. By the way, I'm an artist lawyer, I'm just. But I yeah, that, that's years. one thing you, you find with often, Africa, yeah. with, often with services deals is that it, the artists had some impetus from. Well, no, the impetus is exactly what, what you were talking about, that you, you want the artist to come to you with some value already. Now, whether that's a brand new artist that's worked on their. their their whole thing and got an audience together or got a great record together or whether it's a, 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 a an artist like myself who's been around for a long time and has a known following of course labels are going to want that that's what's going to be attractive but it is off it is possible i think the question is is it possible to be in the four percent without a record company that's really hard because it takes a lot of work as an artist yeah. to do that is it possible to make a living as an artist without a record label and i think you can do that you can make a living you can keep the wall from the door you can get on with your business, so long as you don't want to be in the charts and on later every other week and all that kind of stuff. And you're doing gigs and putting records out and, and servicing the people that are into what you're doing, it is possible to carry on making a living. And that's why, and much, for much longer as well, I think for much longer. And that's why having retained some of your rights, because you've not only got the rights to the record, you've got the rights to the outtakes, you've got the rights to the live gigs. And you can, you can monetize that subsequently. You can put together the record with all the outtakes and put your demos on there because you've got them knocking around because the record company have been bought up by somebody else, they've lost them, but you've still got a DAT somewhere or a reel-to-reel -reel, 
and you can clean that up and monetize it. Um, without the rights initially to do that, you're always going to be you're always going to be in trouble. If you've got the rights, then you can start to just to 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 service those people who are really into what you do. S specifically, you talk about making a living. You're you're very well known artists, certainly in this country and and abroad, of course. Mm. But you can sell like Hammersmith Apollo, as we've seen. Um, if you had an eight to fifteen percent deal still on that contract, mm. could you make a living off streaming? Off streaming, that's a good question. That is a, a, a good question. We're going to talk specifically about streaming. I make a respectable amount of money on streaming because of the nature of my deal with Martin. So when I hear artists complain they don't make anything out of streaming whatsoever, I think, well, it can't be Spotify's fault and it can't be the artist's fault. <laughs> I would say it's definitely not Spotify's fault of it, of it, in terms of the money. I mean, I've seen some of the figures of what has been paid to... You know, rights holders, paid to rights holders. Paid to rights holders. Yeah. For artists that we manage, and yeah. you know, the numbers are pretty big. Yeah, we well, see. The question point. is, is what, where point. does that go? Here's, here's the where great thing. Here's the great thing. I'm the rights holder. Yeah, but, <laughs> but exactly. So, so it's good exactly. for rights holders. If you're the rights holder, there's there's not millions to be made on at my level, you know, but there is re reasonable yeah. amount of money to be made from streaming. And when I hear artists who who are getting feel they're abs get, or literally lit, getting nothing then you've got to ask yourself what the rights holders are doing with that and why rights holding becomes a really, really important thing. It's definitely a, 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 a massive, a massive grey area, a massive grey area, and I think something that's going to you know, catch up and how, how these kind of like battleships that are major record companies turn, and we turn very slowly in terms of how mm. you know, the, the contracts catching up with the industry yeah. and the way it moves, but it, yeah, it's, it was quite... Sort of breath, you know, took my breath away seeing the amount of money that was attributed to certain songs and certain artists, and actually then trying to correlate that to um, the you know, severe lack of zeros. On yeah, your yeah, I suppose. And you know, we, uh, obviously it takes time to trickle through, and you know, but <coughs> but yeah, how does that? You know, when when is that gonna? When is it gonna shift? When is it, you know is that gonna be treated? You know, um, well, I used to sign. I offered record uh, contracts to me in the nineteen eighties that included. Uh, uh, five percent breakages. Now you know where that comes from. In the old days, when records were shellac, they used to ship them sh stacked on like a big cardboard toilet roll, ten of them, and the one on the bottom often got dropped and broke. So they mm. always put it. That was still there. When I, it's probably still there now. Yeah, that everything's the everything's done yeah, in in yeah, terms yeah. of. Um, I think I drafted that one, Billy. <laughs> you probably, you did, that's right. You yeah. did for Al Bowley, didn't you? In 1929. <laughs> <laughs> you signed just it. just. Back to the point of, can artists do it without a record company? Um, I, I think that there's a very that there's different perceptions of actually what is a record company, and you know one concept of a record company is um, a company that amasses large numbers of copyrights and exploits them and makes the biggest margin out of them for the company as possible. I think that's one extreme view. Um, I think the the other way of looking at it is that a record company is, is a conduit in between the artist and, and the public. And the job of the record company is to take the music from the artist and get it to the public as effectively as possible in line with what the goals of the artist are, which might be maximum monetization, it might be maximum giving it away for free with maximum exposure or anything in, in between. So really it's representing the artist and taking their rights to the public and just enabling it to do that. And I'd argue that an artist can't do it without a team. You know, an artist, well, an artist can, but not as effectively. You know, you can deliver a, a letter to Aberdeen if you walk up there, but it's easier to use the post office. <laughs> and I think that, you know, an artist needs a publicist, it needs various people in their team, however it takes their, their product to market. Um, we work with, for example, Amanda Palmer, who's famous for doing it without a label. We do her in about 25 different countries. Not, it's not that well known that we do. You know, she raised 1.2 million on, uh, on Kickstarter, and we don't get a lot of mention, but, you know, we've, it's, she, I love working with her. We've got a great relationship. She's given us uh, two other records since then. Um, it, it's... It, it's it's, uh, it's interesting. She sees us now as part of her team, and I think that's... It's really nice. I mean, it, it makes my job a lot more fun to move from the idea of 
the old-fashioned, I would say, idea of just collecting copyrights and exploiting them as well as possible to actually trying to understand the vision of the artist and help them take that vision to market, you know, and, and, and forensically look at what they're trying to achieve in different countries and, you know, put together the team worldwide that help enables them to do that and gives them far more control over their career without them having to walk the whole way to Aberdeen to get the letter there. And I, w I would agree with that, particularly in my case, because I'm sort of averaging an album every four or five years. And you can imagine how much the industry's changing that time. For me to keep up with all those changes, you know, I'd need to be 16. <laughs> so uh, it's very handy to be able to go to see Mark, Martin and explain to him and his team what I want to do. And they can then explain to me the ways that we do that now. For instance, last, you know, this time it was sign up to Spotify. I didn't do anything to do with streaming before. In some ways, I was... I was I think I was against the idea of streaming. You were. Yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> and now, and now I'm, I'm doing, you know, I'm doing like a little radio show for them because they've explained it to me, uh, showed me the check, and um, <laughs> that, we, that we got from them, and I suddenly saw how it made sense. So, and you did Artist Radio before Beats 1. Yeah, well, I was just, I, it just seemed to me that if, we, if we're going to make a list of record, of, of music uh, that we're going to put out here, and you, people are going to listen to it on the streaming, why not explain to them why you love the music? Why just shunt them a list and say... Here's a lot of music from the 1960s you've probably never heard of. If you can get in there and just say why you love this music and what, give it a little bit of context, surely people are going to be more, you know, want to listen to what you've got to say more and everything. And I, so what I do is I choose 12 tracks and I do um, a little insert between each one where I talk for a minute or two about it. And uh, so consequently, when everyone listens to my radio program, I get paid 13 times. So, you know, that's not why I do it, though, but, you know, it's all, it's all, you know. I know there's another lawyer in the room, Russell, over there, but I was just saying, as a lawyer, the future of the record deals for us, I mean, I think, I, I don't want to speak for you, Russell, too much, but transparency, mm. there's no transparency with record company, no. you haven't got a fucking clue what they're doing with your money, if you're the artist. <laughs> what, 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 what's, the, what's, the, what's the worst element of that? Well, just they don't show you the figures, they don't show you what their deals are with the rights holders, with Spotify. Yeah. With, it's all this <laughs> black box. Yeah. should be open to us all. So as artists, lawyers, we want to see it all. Why not? What, what are they hiding? So, so what about Aussie clause? And are in the contract? Exactly. Well, we can put something in to deal with that. The other thing we want is we want 50% of everything, not 15 or 8%. Streaming income, all the digital income should be split at least half. If you're dire straits who don't make any records anymore, their back catalogue's on a 50-50 with Universal, net profit. I'm, I'm just speaking out, because obviously it's the future of the record deal, so I'm just trying to make a pitch. How did that, how did that happen, the 50-50 with dire straits? Well, I wonder, they sold 175 million albums. <laughs> and they went back and renegotiated. Yeah, exactly. So it wasn't on the old 175 million album. Deal, no, but... But going forward, they've obviously earned the right, as Billy has, to have these preferential deals. But I think, as an artist lawyer, what I also feel is a lot of artists fail, the 96%, but for them, their record, their one or two albums of the major, is the most important asset they'll ever have. Mm. And that gets buried by the record company. So what I'd like record companies to do is also, when people fail, not to hang on to stuff. Even though we put it out, mate, we sold five copies, you can't have it back. That's the attitude. Mm. Yeah, but well, they be... might die, or someone might say, oh, it was a work of genius, and we all forgot about it, and then all of a sudden they're no, in the money. No, no, that's no, but the... That's, that, that, as Billy said, the artist has one career. They're very selfish. They need to... So I think rights should come back to the artist <coughs> if they pay it. Apart from when they succeed. We're all talking about success. It's easy mm. to legislate for success and be Michael Jackson on $3.50 an hour. Well, he's dead, of course, but... Mm. You know, I'm just saying that the record deals have to change to factor in failure and success. I think. I'm interested that you didn't mention, which is something I want to move the conversation on to, um, live rights and merch rights. Is it fair that there's two sides to this argument, right? One is that the record companies lost all their, a lot of money in the Napster era. They took a land grab, took some rights back in order to, to have some more money through the door. The other point of view, which I might, might well subscribe to, and I'm going to speak for you, is that the record company does all the legwork in, in um, getting an artist brand out there and increasing their notoriety and their um, popularity. Where do you stand on it? Are you comfortable with any 360 deal? Well, the, the 360 doesn't really exist. It's more like a 270, because very rarely do you throw the publishing in. So if you want to call it a 270 deal, I never use the word 360, but it's a bit misleading that. I think, going to what I've just said, if, the, if your label becomes your partner and you share all the information, <laughs> you share all the income, mm and you have rights return, reverting to the artist in a much shorter period of time, then there is an argument to bring in other income streams passively. You don't, record companies can't own those, so they don't provide any real expertise, but until the band have recouped. But there, are, there are lots of clever ways of doing it, but record labels don't like lawyers and managers building in success formulas, mm. or failure, failure formulas, you know. And I think if you sell a million albums, why doesn't your deal radically change? 
If a label knew they were going to sell a million albums, you could guarantee that. You'd give them an amazing deal up front, wouldn't you? Well, usually what happens if we sell a million records, the law and the manager are in, beating the hell out well, of us. Well, a million's not enough. I think you'd, you'd just say, well, that's not enough. No, uh, no, 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 no. A million <laughs> records, you'll be in renegotiating. Okay. Or you, you wouldn't be doing your writing. job properly. But no, I mean, that's, that's always been my experience. As soon as... As soon as an artist these days has any success, they're in renegotiating their deal. So they can't even enjoy that million moment unfettered. No. I no. think it should all be, I mean, let's get rid of lawyers completely. Why don't you just have a standard contract that builds in success and failure? I, I wouldn't need to have a job then. I, I could go home and garden. <laughs> Google, Google put away but, but record companies don't want to do it. They, they, they know what they'll give someone who sells a million. So why don't you just put it in now? Just have a Schedule B, a million sales, Schedule D, two million sales, Schedule because C. Because every contract is different, because every artist is different. Well, and, and well, success isn't different, is it? Yeah, but every P&L that we write for every artist that we sign is different. I know, but we, you could make it easier. Phil. Yes. Can you um, justify to yourself and to your artists giving away live and merch rights? You know, it, again, it's not, not ideal in any way or form, but, I mean, obviously it's become, um, I wouldn't say standardised, but certainly in the majors it's, it's a, the, the first, the first, you know, the, 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 the first sort of thing on the table. It will say, we want, you know, we want, we want a percentage of live, we want, we want a percentage of merch. Um, look, I mean, you can understand the record company's side of things. I think Paul makes a very good point based on the fact that if it was more of a transparent, um, partnership, then you wouldn't feel as hard done by, by it. But again, if you, if you can build nice to a certain degree, and you know there's a buzz, you can maybe get away from signing over those rights. If a record company is going to put a hundred thousand pounds worth of tour support um, behind an artist, you know you can, you can understand it to a degree. Now, does that always happen? No. Um, it's generally. Um, you know, based on uh, you know, mutual consent, uh, something that you both have got to agree is the right thing to do. Um, it's not a tap that's basically on constantly until that point is, is reached. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very tough one. But again, it depends on the artist, what you're doing. Um, you know, some artists have global... You, you, can, you can start work with an artist early on and realise that they've got global appeal and, or, or, you know, in that lane a science record company that want to push this artist, you know, uh, in multiple territories, and you're going to need that money. So if they're going to invest it, yeah, there's, there's going to be something, you, you know, you're going to have to deal with. I think what Paul points out, I think it's really important that there are sort of um, <clears throat> levels where you can, you know, the, the rights revert, revert back to you. I think that's very, you know, that, that's achievable. Can be difficult sometimes um, to get that at a point of recouping. It should come back. All these, all these points again, artist by artist case really. Um, so in short, to answer your question, um, again, depends on what you're trying to achieve. You know, if you're going to need it, then unfortunately sometimes it's you know you have to sell your soul to, to do to have you know to have that you know have have that uh, that tap on. Mm. Um, but then some artists don't necessarily need it. Um, I, 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 I was speaking to a, a major label based uh, in New York <coughs> recently and it was really interesting to me, something I picked up on various executives said, they didn't say that artist is a success, we've reached gold, or that artist is a success, we've reached platinum. They all said, we sold out Madison Square Garden, or yeah. in a year we're going to sell out Madison Square yeah. Garden. And I thought, that's very interesting that that's becoming your benchmark. So my question, which I just want to bring Martin back into, is we're talking about the future of the record uh, contract or the record deal. But will you even be a record company in five to ten years? That's uh, a, a really good question. Um, just, just quickly, I, I want to just reinforce what Paul said, which is whenever a record deal's done, um, everyone focuses on this is going to be the next big thing, this is going to be really successful. No one ever thinks about what's going to happen if it fails. And I think it is, it's actually not a big ask to say if this fails and you're not selling anything, at least get, give us the physical rights back so we can do what we want with those. You can make it, and as so long as you make it available online in all the services digitally, give us the physical rights back. That's not a big ask. And, but no one thinks about failure when they're doing the deal. And I think every lawyer should insert clauses like that. And I think it's very hard to argue, any lawyer on any label to argue against them. So I think that's a really good point, Paul. Um, but in terms of... Uh, you being a record company or Yeah. Uh, I, I think that it's... Yes, definitely. I think there's a role for... A, an artist needs a team. 
to take their music to the public. And that role is going to change massively. Um, but I think that that role is going to be there. You know, I, I think that an artist needs a team to handle a worldwide rollout, just in, in the same way that an artist needs a booking agent, a manager, a publisher. They need people to handle a worldwide rollout of music to maybe help them make the music, maybe not. Um, they need a, a, a team you know, to help with the marketing and promotion, to deal with all the uh, different digital services. I mean, you know, who would have thought vinyl would be uh, rising in the way it has? It's, it's an always changing. And if you put out a record every two years, you're getting out of touch very mm. quickly. If you're putting out 30 records a year, you really understand the market far you better. You're an that's, expert. That, that's, that's the real big thing. It's because if you, are, if you are doing it yourself and you will have to have a team around you of a similar size to, to the team that you have at a record label or management or elsewhere, you'll have to build that if you are going to do it yourself. You're doing it once every few years. You're not going to see the obvious pitfalls that have, that have developed with a, a label that's been, been working artists similar to yourself and has also probably had their eye on other artists who are a bit like you. They may at least be able to point out to you some of the things that might better work for you and might not work for you. So I think that for all the freedom that the internet has given us, um, continuing to work with record labels is... I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very important aspect of what we're trying to do. Yes, we should be able to do what we can do on our own websites and through our own interaction with artists. We should be able to, you know, act as a, a, a retailer as well as a, as a <coughs> performer on those things as well. But ultimately, to work with a, the, the, the things that a record label can bring to what you're trying to do, it's still going to be worth doing deals with record label. But the sort of transparency that Paul was talking about is going to be, I think that's going to be an absolute key thing as well. That we all sit down and say to each other, well, why are we making so little from streaming? And where's, you know, what happens with these black box deals that they do with telephone companies and stuff like that, you know? These kind of issues uh, we're going to have to sit down and, and be, be very frank with. Because the, the alternative is you're stuck with doing it all yourself. And that's when you get into a situation where rather than being an artist, you become more of a business person. And that puts you in a very difficult situation vis-a-vis -vis the, the creative process, I think. Um, before I ask if anyone in the audience has got a question, I've just got one question for all of you, starting with Billy, I think, and then we'll move our way through to Phil. Uh, YouTube is the biggest and the fastest growing music streaming service in the world. Does that worry you or excite you for the future? It worries me. Uh, and it worries me that um, uh, Google are going to bring out a mu music streaming service as well, because their main competitor is going to be YouTube. Why would you bring out a music s a service to to compete with the biggest streamer, YouTube, unless you wanted to destroy everybody else in the market. I think just, it's just, they've just merged, effectively merged the management of the two. I think it's a Starbucks uh, uh, a strategy to put a coffee shop on every corner and kill the competition. I think I, I still think that YouTube is our is the biggest problem that the music industry faces at the moment. Paul, well, I think Billy's put it well, but I think uh, as a lawyer, what you want is again transparency and the ability to have a discussion at the top table to see what we can get from that pie that we we must. Big, very big pie. We don't see much of it. Martin, you see the crust of that pie. If we're going to continue the metaphor, and um, how are you feeling about YouTube? Um, I've got very mixed feelings about YouTube. I mean, it's interesting if you look in, in, in Germany where there's been a massive dispute between YouTube and Gamer, how healthy the, the physical market is in, in Germany and you know how, how healthy the market is in, in Germany. What Perhaps is the market, Martin? Well, it's about 70% physical still in Germany, and, and you know the market itself is, is very strong. Um, but on, on the other hand, a lot of what YouTube does is... I mean, first of all, the biggest job for a record company is... is uh, well, it could be to monetize music, but I actually started it because I just wanted people to hear the stuff. And YouTube's brilliant at that. There's no denying it. It's the biggest way people consume music on the planet and I you know I started putting out records just because I wanted people to hear this stuff it wasn't about <coughs> making money out of it and I think part of me you know is is there's this part of me loves that part of me does want to monetize it in terms of getting the message out YouTube's brilliant in terms of mon monetizing it it's tough <laughs> um, Mike uh, major labels have seen to Start to stand up to YouTube a bit this year. We've seen One Direction kind of take action. I think Ellie Goulding did something similar recently. I know obviously not labels you were working with, but interesting observation. Um, are you worried again? Worried or excited about what it can bring in the future? 
Um, I'm not entirely convinced YouTube as an organization is committed to music. I don't think that's really where it sees its, um, its future. It's Google. Part. I don't think Google are. No, it's, that, that isn't where... That, it, it's something that's peripheral to what they do. I think, obviously, we need to recognize what they're doing. We need to, <laughs> to make sure our artists are, are, you know, are properly compensated for all the, the, the music that's being consumed through YouTube. Um, and YouTube is an enormous part of how we break our acts. And Vivo, you know, obviously is, is, is a big part. We can't ignore that. I think we need to, to deal with them, you know, but we need, in order that we can get the best possible, you know, relationships going for our artists. But it, 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 does, it does obviously give me concern. <coughs> I, I, I want to believe that, you know, the businesses, the streaming businesses that are completely about music, like Spotify, will triumph because they're totally focused on giving you an excellent relationship with music. YouTube is about providing a much broader entertainment platform. It's, it's not really about how do we give people access to great music. Mm. It's, it's much more about smiling cats, unfortunately. <laughs> <coughs> Phil, um, how, 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 yeah, how, how do you balance the two off? The promotional uh, value, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, we've got YouTube coming next week, actually. So i will be better place to tell you what their plans are. But, but look, I mean, I think the, the promotional, you know, as a manager, as, you know, as, a, as an artist who have multiple rights and, you know, uh, YouTube is a vehicle to get your music heard and be seen and for those people to buy tickets, for those people to buy T-shirts. Hey, you know, it, it's, it's super important as long as, you know, the people who own our rights, whether it's us or the record label, are kind of making sure we're getting paid for that and hopefully seeing that at some point, once transparency is sorted out based on streaming, then great. Um, brilliant, but I, I suppose for us it's like to take that, you know, for that not to be in the mix. Um, uh, I think this would be a, con a concern because it's such a, you know, it's become such a, a massive platform. So I'm, you know, it doesn't leave me in cold sweats yet. Let's see what they say next week. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, not, yeah, that's how I feel about it, basically. Mixed feelings. <laughs> yeah, mixed. Uh, does anyone in the audience have a question? Oh, I love it when that happens. Why do lights keep flashing on and on? That's the fire one and on. Thanks, heavens, for that. Um, OK, right, I will ask a final question then. If, if, if no one else will, it falls to me. I want to ask again, starting from Billy and moving to the end, quickly in one sentence, there's one thing you would like to see um, in, uh, included in the future record contract. What would it be and why? Well, I, obviously, I would like to see um, uh, reversions. Uh, the, the principle of uh, a partnership with record companies rather than uh, ownership. Um, you know, we're not slaves. That's a stupid analogy to make. But we are businessmen and we have... Record labels have lots of chances to, to have hit records and, and to make money down the line, but we only have that one chance in our career. And to give us the opportunity, after we've been making music for 50 years, to still be able to make a living, it should be, fundamentally, it should really be our pensions rather than the record executive who signs us pensions. That's what I'd like to see. Paul, I guess it's one of your five, but which is the, the burning priority? One sentence, you said. That was a long sentence. If possible. Yeah. That's because I'm a performance. So I breathe, I speak from my head and my uh, diaphragm. There's lots of semicolons in there. That's fine. Um, it, difficult question to answer. I, I just think it's partnership with transparency, rights. That's it. A free thing, then. Great. But one sentence. Martin. That's true. <laughs> um, I, think, I think that record contracts are going to be totally different in five years' time with outside funding. I think the, the biggest things in them are partnership, I'll agree, totally transparency. I mean, we, we don't tend to own copyrights anyway, so that's not an issue anymore for me at all. So I, 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 the biggest issue is transparency, because if you're honest with people's money, they trust you. And I think that's really important. If people understand what's happening with their money, they trust you, which is really good for your relationship and they make better business decisions which is also really good for their relationship and your relationship. Mike, one thing that you'd like to see in a future I'm afraid I have to agree with Mike, it's transparency. <laughs> and I think, you know, so many of the problems that we, we have in the industry are because people are not entirely sure that we're telling the truth and I think if we've got nothing to hide we should be completely open with people. 
Um, yeah, I kind of have to agree with that. But I think, um, yeah, I think, I think, uh, for from the get go, the you know, the record company and the artist sort of you know, collectively work as a partnership really, and 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 for everyone to to, to sort of take you know to work that way, and the, which involves transparency fundamentally at the end of the day, doesn't it? And that's the big, the big thing, knowing what where. Your money's going. Who's getting paid? What? Where's money from Spotify going? Streaming, all these things that are going to affect the industry uh, and going to be, sort of become the biggest sort of talking points, which are the talking points now, but which are going to become even more um, important over the next next year or so. Great. It's um, it's been a rarity for me to kind of not have half the panel singing from the same industry. It's been really nice to get the sort of different perspectives. Some clashes, but mainly agreement at the end there. Uh, it leads me to thank Billy Paul. Martin, Mike, and Phil. Oh, I, 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 should, I should say, keep an eye out for future in the future, future the future of events uh, happening here. I would guess in the new year. And thank you very much, Tim, for sharing this. Thanks again to everyone for doing it. I'm really honoured to have you all here, and thanks for everyone for coming. Session. We weren't told. I don't want to change the world. I'm not looking for a new.